Section six of Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo de Amicis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. December. The Trader. Thursday the first. My father wishes me to have some one of my schoolmates come to our house every holiday, or that I should go to see one of them, in order that I may gradually become friends with all of them. Sunday I shall go to walk with Votini, the well-dressed boy who is always brushing himself up, and who is so envious of De Rossi. In the meantime Garoffi came to the house to-day, that long, lank boy with the nose like an owl's beak and small, knavish eyes, which seem to be ferreting everywhere. He is the son of a grocer, and is a queer fellow. He is always counting the soldi in his pocket. He reckons them on his fingers very, very rapidly, and goes through some process of multiplication without any tables. And he hoards his money, and already has a book in the scholar's savings bank. He never spends a soldo, I am positive. And if he drops a centesimo under the benches, he is likely to hunt for it a week. He does as magpies do, so de Rossi says. Everything that he finds— worn-out pens postage stamps that have been used pins candle ends he picks up he has been collecting postage stamps for more than two years now and he already has hundreds of them from every country in a large album which he will sell to a bookseller later on when he has got it quite full meanwhile the bookseller gives him his copy books because he takes a great many boys to the shop in school he is always bartering he affects sales of little articles every day and gets up lotteries and exchanges then he regrets the trade and wants his stuff back again. He buys for two and sells for four. He plays at pitchpenny and never loses. He sells old newspapers over again to the tobacconist, and he keeps a little blank book full of figures in which he sets down his transactions. At school he studies nothing but arithmetic, and if he desires the medal, it is only that he may have free entrance into the puppet show. But he pleases me. He amuses me. We played at keeping a market with weights and scales. He knows the exact price of everything. He understands weighing, and quickly makes handsome paper horns like shopkeepers. He declares that as soon as he has finished school he shall set up in business, in a new business which he has invented himself. He was very much pleased when I gave him some foreign postage stamps, and he informed me exactly how each one sold for collections. My father pretended to be reading the newspaper, but he listened to him, and was greatly diverted his pockets are bulging full of little wares and he covers them up with a long black cloak and always appears thoughtful and preoccupied with business like a merchant but the thing that has nearest his heart is his collection of postage stamps this is his treasure and he always speaks of it as though he were going to get a fortune out of it the boys accuse him of miserliness and usury i do not know i like him he teaches me a great many things he seems a man to me Coretti, the son of the wood merchant, said that Garoffi would not give him his postage stamps to save his mother's life. My father does not believe it. Wait a little before you condemn him, he said to me. He has this passion, but he has heart as well. Vanity, Monday the 5th Yesterday I went for a walk along the Rivoli Road with Votini and his father. As we were passing through the Dora Grossa Street, we saw Stardi, the boy who kicks at those who bother him, standing stiffly in front of the window of a bookshop, with his eyes fixed on a map, and no one knows how long he had been there, because he studies even in the street. He barely returned our salute, the rude fellow. Votini was well dressed, even too much so. He had on Morocco boots embroidered in red, an embroidered coat, small silken tassels, a white beaver hat, and a watch, and he strutted but his vanity was to come to a bad end this time. After having gone a tolerably long distance up the Rivoli Road, leaving his father, who was walking slowly, a long way in the rear, we halted at a stone seat beside a modestly clad boy who appeared to be weary and moody, and who sat with a drooping head. A man who must have been his father was walking to and fro under the trees reading the newspaper. We sat down. Votini placed himself between me and the boy. All at once he recollected that he was well-dressed, and wanted to make his neighbor admire and envy him. He lifted one foot and said to me, "'Have you seen my officer's boots?' He said this in order to make the other boy look at them, but the latter paid no attention. 
then he dropped his foot and showed me his silk tassels glancing slyly at the boy the while and said that these tassels did not please him and that he wanted to have them changed to silver buttons but the boy did not look at the tassels either then votini fell to twirling his handsome white hat on the tip of his forefinger but the boy and it seemed as though he did it on purpose did not deign even a glance at the hat votini who began to be irritated drew out his watch opened it and showed me the wheels but the boy did not turn his head is it of silver gilt i asked him no he replied it is gold but not merely of gold i said there must be some silver with it why no he retorted and in order to compel the boy to look he held the watch before his face and said to him say look here isn't it true that it is entirely of gold the boy replied briefly i don't know oh oh exclaimed votini full of wrath what pride as he was saying this his father came up and heard him he looked steadily at the lad for a moment then said sharply to his son hold your tongue and bending down to his ear he added he is blind votini sprang to his feet with a shudder and stared the boy in the face the latter's eyeballs were glassy without expression without sight votini stood humbled speechless with his eyes fixed on the ground at length he stammered i'm sorry i did not know but the blind boy who had understood it all said with a kind sad smile oh it's no matter well votini is vain but his heart is not bad he never laughed again during the whole of the walk the first snowstorm saturday the tenth farewell walks to rivoli here is the beautiful friend of the boys here is the first snow ever since yesterday evening it has been falling in thick flakes as large as gilly flowers it was a pleasure this morning at school to see it beat against the panes and pile up on the window sills even the master watched it and rubbed his hands and all were glad when they thought of making snowballs and of the ice which will come later and of the hearth at home stardi entirely absorbed in his lessons and with his fists pressed to his temples was the only one who paid no attention to it what beauty what a celebration there was when we left school all danced down the streets shouting and tossing their arms catching up handfuls of snow and dashing about in it like poodles in water the umbrellas of the parents who were waiting outside were all white the policeman's helmet was white all our satchels were white in a few moments every one appeared to be beside himself with joy even precossi the son of the blacksmith that pale boy who never laughs and robetti the lad who saved the little child from the omnibus poor fellow jumped about on his crutches the calabrian who had never touched snow made himself a little ball of it and began to eat it as though it had been a peach crossi the son of the vegetable vendor filled his satchel with it and muratorino made us burst with laughter when my father invited him to come to our house to-morrow he had his mouth full of snow and not daring either to spit it out or to swallow it he stood there choking and staring at us and made no answer even the schoolmistress came out of school on a run laughing but my mistress of the upper first poor little thing ran through the drizzling snow covering her face with her green veil and coughing meanwhile Hundreds of girls from the neighboring schoolhouse passed by, screaming and frolicking on that white carpet. And the masters and the beadles and the policemen shouted, Home! Home! Swallowing flakes of snow and whitening their mustaches and beards. But they too laughed at this wild romp of the scholars as they celebrated the winter. You hail the arrival of winter, but there are boys who have neither clothes, nor shoes, nor fire. There are thousands of them, who descend to their villages over a long road, carrying in hands, bleeding from chilblains, a bit of wood to warm the schoolroom. There are hundreds of schools almost buried in the snow, bare and dismal as caves, where the boys suffocate with smoke or chatter their teeth with cold, as they gaze in terror at the white flakes which descend unceasingly, which pile up constantly on their distant cabins threatened by avalanches. You rejoice in the winter, boys. Think of the thousands of creatures to whom winter brings misery and death. Your father. Muratorino, the little mason. The little mason came today in a hunting jacket, entirely dressed in the cast off clothes of his father, which were still white with lime and plaster. My father was even more anxious than I that he should come, 
how much pleasure he gives us no sooner had he entered than he pulled off his ragged cap which was all soaked with snow and thrust it into one of his pockets he came forward with his listless gait like a weary workman turning his face as smooth as an apple with its ball-like nose from side to side and when he entered the dining-room he cast a glance round at the furniture and fixed his eyes on a small picture of rigoletto a hunchbacked jester and made a hare's face it is impossible to keep from laughing when he makes that hare's face we went to playing with bits of wood he is good at making towers and bridges which seem to stand as though by miracle and he works at it quite seriously with the patience of a man between one tower and another he told me about his family they live in a garret his father goes to the evening school to learn to read and his mother is a washerwoman and they must love him of course for he is clad like a poor boy but he is well protected from the cold with neatly mended clothes and with his necktie nicely tied by his mother his father he told me is a fine man a giant who has trouble in getting through doors but he is kind and always calls his son's hair face the son on the contrary is rather small at four o'clock we lunched on bread and goat's milk cheese as we sat on the sofa and when we rose i do not know why but my father did not wish me to brush off the back which the little mason had spotted with white from his jacket he held my hand and then rubbed it off himself on the sly while we were playing the little mason lost a button from his hunting jacket and my mother sewed it on and he grew quite red and began to watch her sew in perfect amazement and confusion holding his breath the while then we gave him some albums of caricatures to look at and he without being aware of it himself imitated the grimaces of the faces there so well that even my father laughed he was so much pleased when he went away that he forgot to put on his tattered cap and when we reached the landing he made a hare's face at me once more in sign of his gratitude his name is antonio rabuco and he is eight years and eight months old do you know my son why i did not wish you to wipe off the sofa because to wipe it while your friend was looking on would have been almost the same as reproving him for having soiled it and this was not well in the first place because he did not do it intentionally and in the next because he did it with the clothes of his father who had covered them with plaster while at work and what comes from work is not dirt it is dust lime varnish whatever you like but it is not dirt labor does not soil one never say of a laborer coming from his work he is filthy you should say he has on his clothes the signs the traces of his toil remember this and you must love the little mason first because he is your comrade and next because he is the son of a working man your father a snowball friday the sixteenth and still it snows a bad accident happened because of the snow this morning when we came out of school a crowd of boys had no sooner got into the corso than they began to throw balls of wet snow which make missiles as solid and heavy as stones many persons were passing along the sidewalks a gentleman called out stop that you little rascals and just then a sharp cry arose from another part of the street and we saw an old man who had lost his hat and was staggering about covering his face with his hands and beside him a boy who was shouting help help people instantly ran from all directions he had been struck in the eye with a ball all the boys dispersed fleeing like arrows I was standing in front of the bookseller's shop, into which my father had gone, and I saw several of my schoolmates coming at a run, mingling with others near me, and pretending to be engaged in staring at the windows. There was Garone, with his penny-roll in his pocket, as usual, Coretti, Muratorino, and Garoffi, the boy with the postage stamps. In the meantime a crowd had formed around the old man, and a policeman and others were running to and fro, threatening and demanding, Who was it? Who did it? Was it you? Tell me who did it and they looked at the boy's hands to see whether they were wet with snow. Garoffi was standing beside me. I noticed that he was trembling all over, and that his face was as white as that of a corpse. Who was it? Who did it? the crowd continued to cry. Then I overheard Garoni say in a low voice to Garoffi, Come, give yourself up. It would be cowardly to allow anyone else to be arrested. But I did not do it on purpose, replied Garoffi, trembling like a leaf. No matter, do your duty, repeated Garone. But I have not the courage. Take courage, then. I will accompany you. And the policemen and the other people were crying more loudly than ever. Who was it? Who did it? One of his glasses had been driven into his eye. He has been blinded. 
The ruffians! I thought that Garoffi would fall to the earth. Come, said Garone resolutely, I will defend you. And grasping him by the arm, he thrust him forward, supporting him as though he had been a sick man. The people saw and instantly understood, and several persons ran up with their fists raised, but Garone thrust himself between, crying, Do ten men of you set on one boy? Then they ceased, and a policeman seized Garoffi by the hand and led him, pushing aside the crowd as he went, to a pastry-cook's shop, where the wounded man had been carried. On catching sight of him I suddenly recognized him as the old employee who lives on the fourth floor of our house with his grandnephew. He was stretched out on a chair with a handkerchief over his eyes. "'I did not do it on purpose,' sobbed Garoffi, half dead with terror. "'I did not do it on purpose!' Two or three persons thrust him violently into the shop, crying, "'Down to the earth! Beg his pardon!' and they threw him to the ground. But all at once two vigorous arms set him on his feet again, and a resolute voice said, "'No, gentlemen!' It was our principal, who had seen it all. "'Since he has had the courage to give himself up,' he added, "'no one has the right to humiliate him.' All stood silent. "'Ask his forgiveness,' said the principal to Garoffi. Garoffi, bursting into tears, embraced the old man's knees, and the latter, having felt for the boy's head with his hand, caressed his hair. Then all said, "'Go, boy, go return home.' And my father drew me out of the crowd, and said as we passed along the street, "'Enrico, would you have had the courage, under similar circumstances, to do your duty, to go and confess your fault?' I told him that I should, and he said, "'Give me your word, as a lad of heart and honour, that you would do it.' I give you my word, father. The Schoolmistresses, Saturday the 17th. Today, Garoffi stood in fear and dread of a severe punishment from the teacher, but the master did not appear, and as the assistant was also missing, Signora Cromi, the oldest of the schoolmistresses, came to teach the school. She has two grown-up children, and she has taught several women to read and write, who now come with their sons to the Baretti schoolhouse. She was sad to-day, because one of her sons is ill. No sooner had the boys caught sight of her than they began to make an uproar, but she said in a slow and calm tone, "'Respect my white hair. I am not only a school-teacher, I am also a mother.' And then no one dared to speak again in spite of that brazen face of Franti, who contented himself with jeering at her on the sly. Signora del Cati, my brother's teacher, was sent to take charge of Signora Cromi's class, and to Signora del Cati's was sent the teacher who is called the Little Nun, because she always dresses in dark colours with a black apron, and has a small white face, hair that is always smooth, very bright eyes, and a delicate voice that seems to be for ever murmuring prayers. It is hard to understand, my mother says. She is so gentle and timid. With that thread of a voice, which is always even, which is hardly audible, and she never speaks loud, nor flies into a passion, but nevertheless she keeps the boys so quiet that you cannot hear them, and the most roguish bow their heads when she merely admonishes them with her finger, so that her school seems like a church, and it is for this reason also that she is called the little nun. But there is another one I like, the young mistress of the lower first, the girl with the rosy face, who has two pretty dimples in her cheeks, and who wears a large red feather on her little bonnet, and a small cross of yellow glass on her neck. She is always cheerful, and keeps her class cheerful. She is always calling out with that silvery voice of hers, which makes her seem to be singing, and tapping her little rod on the table, and clapping her hands to impose silence. When they come out of school she runs after one and another like a child, to bring them back into line. She pulls up the cape of one, and buttons the coat of another, so they may not take cold. She follows them even into the street, in order that they may not fall to quarrelling. She begs the parents not to whip them at home. She brings lozenges to those who have coughs. She lends her muff to those who are cold. And she is continually tormented by the smallest children, who caress her and demand kisses, and pull at her veil and mantle. But she lets them do it, and kisses them all with a smile, and returns home all rumpled, and with her throat all bare, panting and happy, with her beautiful dimples and her red feather. She is also the girl's drawing-teacher, and she supports her mother and her brother by her earnings. End of section 6section 7 of heart a schoolboy's journal this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heart, a Schoolboy's Journal by Edmondo de Amicis. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. December, Part Two. The Wounded Man. Sunday the 18th. The grand nephew of the old employee who was struck in the eye by Garafi Snowball is in the room of the schoolmistress who has the red feather. We saw him today with his uncle, who treats him like a son. I had finished writing out the monthly story for the coming week, The Little Florentine Scribe, which the master had given me to copy, and my father said to me, Let us go up to the fourth floor and see how that old gentleman's eye is. We entered a room which was almost dark, where the old man was sitting up in bed with a great many pillows behind his shoulders. By the bedside sat his wife, and in one corner his nephew was amusing himself. The old man's eye was bandaged. He was very glad to see my father. He made us sit down, and said that he was better, that his eye was not only not ruined, but that he should be quite well again in a few days. It was an accident, he added. I regret the terror which it must have caused that poor boy. Then he talked to us about the doctor, whom he expected every moment to attend him. Just then the doorbell rang. "'There is the doctor,' said his wife. The door opened, and whom did I see? Garoffi, in his long cloak, standing with bowed head on the threshold, and without the courage to enter. "'Who is it?' asked the sick man. "'It is the boy who threw the snowball,' said my father. And then the old man said, "'Oh, my poor boy, come here.' You have come to inquire after the wounded man, have you not? But he is better, be at ease. He is better and almost well. Come here. Garafi, who did not see us in his confusion, approached the bed, forcing himself not to cry. And the old man caressed him, but could not speak. Thank you, said the old man. Go and tell your father and mother that all is going well, and that they are not to think any more about it. But Garafi did not move and seemed to have something to say which he dared not utter. "'What have you to say to me? What do you want?' "'I... nothing.' "'Well, good-bye, until we meet again, my boy. Go with your heart in peace.' Garafi went as far as the door, but there he halted, turned to the nephew who was following him, and who gazed curiously at him. All at once he pulled some object from beneath his cloak, put it in the boy's hand, and whispered hastily to him, "'It is for you.' and away he went like a flash. The boy carried the object to his uncle. He saw that on it was written, I give you this. He looked inside and uttered an exclamation of surprise. It was the famous album, with his collection of postage stamps, which poor Garoffi had brought, the collection about which he was always talking, upon which he had founded so many hopes, and which had cost him so much trouble. It was his treasure, poor boy, it was the half of his very blood, which he had given in exchange for his pardon. THE LITTLE FLORENTINE SCRIBE MONTHLY STORY He was in the fourth elementary class. He was a graceful Florentine lad of twelve, with black hair and a pale face, the eldest son of an employee on the railway, who, having a large family and but small pay, lived in straitened circumstances. His father loved him, and was kind and indulgent to him indulgent in everything except in what concerned school. On this point he required a great deal, and was severe, because his son was obliged to obtain such a rank as would enable him to obtain a place and help his family, and in order to accomplish anything quickly it was necessary that he should work a great deal in a very short time. So although the lad studied, his father was always exhorting him to study more. His father was advanced in years, and too much toil had aged him before his time. Nevertheless, in order to provide for the necessities of his family, in addition to the toil which his occupation imposed upon him, he obtained special work here and there as a copyist, and passed a good part of the night at his writing-table. Lately he had undertaken, in behalf of a house which published journals and books in parts, to write upon the parcels the names and addresses of their subscribers, and he earned three lira for every five hundred of these paper wrappers written in large and regular characters but this work wearied him, and he often complained of it to his family at dinner. "'My eyes are giving out,' he said. "'This night-work is killing me.' One day his son said to him, "'Let me work instead of you, papa. You know that I can write like you, and fairly well.' But the father answered, 
"'No, my son, you must study. "'Your school is a much more important thing than my wrappers. "'I would hate to rob you of a single hour. "'I thank you, but I will not have it. "'Do not mention it to me again.' The son knew that it was useless to insist on such a matter with his father, and he did not persist, but this is what he did. He knew that exactly at midnight his father stopped writing, and quitted his workroom to go to his bedroom. He had heard him several times. So soon as the twelve strokes of the clock had sounded, he had heard the sound of a chair drawn back and the slow step of his father. One night he waited until the latter was in bed, then dressed himself very, very softly and felt his way to the little workroom lighted the petroleum lamp again, seated himself at the writing-table where lay a pile of white wrappers and the list of addresses, and began to write, imitating exactly his father's handwriting. And he wrote with a will, gladly, a little in fear, and the wrappers piled up. From time to time he dropped a pen to rub his hands, and then began again with increased alacrity, listening and smiling. He wrote a hundred and sixty, one lira. Then he stopped, placed the pen where he had found it, put out the light, and went back to bed on tiptoe. At noon the next day his father sat down to the table in a good humour. He had noticed nothing. He did the work mechanically, measuring it by the hour, and thinking of something else, and only counted the wrappers he had written on the following day. Slapping his son on one shoulder, he said to him, "Eh, hey, Giulio, your father is even a better workman than you thought. In two hours I did a good third more work than usual last night. My hand is still nimble, and my eyes still do their duty and Giulio, silent but content, said to himself, Poor Daddy, besides the money, I am giving him much satisfaction in the thought that he has grown young again. Well, courage! Encouraged by these good results, when night came and twelve o'clock struck, he rose once more and set to work, and this he did for several nights. And his father noticed nothing. Only once at supper he remarked, It is strange how much oil has been used in this house lately. This was a shock to Giulio but the conversation ceased there, and the nightly labor went on. However, on account of breaking his sleep every night, Giulio did not get sufficient rest. He rose in the morning fatigued, and when he was doing his schoolwork in the evening, he had difficulty in keeping his eyes open. One evening, for the first time in his life, he fell asleep over his copy-book. "'Courage! Courage!' cried his father, clapping his hands. "'To work!' He shook himself and set to work again but the next evening, and on the days following, the same thing occurred, and worse. He dozed over his books, he rose later than usual, he studied his lessons in a languid way, he seemed disgusted with study. His father began to observe him, then to reflect seriously, and at last to reprove him. He should never have done it. Julio, he said to him one morning, you put me out of patience. You are no longer as you used to be. I don't like it. Take care. All the hopes of your family rest on you. I am dissatisfied, do you understand? At this reproof, the first severe one in truth which he had ever received, the boy grew troubled. Yes, he said to himself, it is true, it cannot go on so, this deceit must come to an end. But at dinner, on the evening of that very same day, his father said with much cheerfulness, Do you know that this month I have earned thirty-two lira more at addressing those wrappers than last month? and so saying, he drew from under the table a paper package of sweets which he had bought, that he might celebrate with his children this unusual profit, and they all hailed it with clapping of hands. Giulio took courage again, and said in his heart, No, poor papa, I shall not cease to deceive you. I shall make greater efforts to work during the day, but I shall continue to work at night for you and for the rest. And his father added, Thirty-two lira more. I am satisfied." But that boy there, pointing at Giulio, is the one who displeases me. And Giulio received the reprimand in silence, forcing back two tears which tried to flow, but at the same time he felt a great pleasure in his heart. And he continued to work by main force, but fatigue added to fatigue rendered it ever more difficult for him to resist. Thus things went on for two months. The father continued to reproach his son and to gaze at him with eyes which grew constantly more wrathful. One day he went to make inquiries of the teacher, and the teacher said to him, Yes, he gets along because he is intelligent, but he no longer has the good will which he had at first. He is drowsy, he yawns, his mind is distracted. He writes short compositions, scribbled down in all haste and badly. Oh, he could do a great deal, a great deal more. 
That evening the father took the son aside and spoke to him words which were graver than any the latter had ever heard. Julio, you see how I toil, how I am wearing out my life for the family. You do not second my efforts. You have no heart for me, nor for your brothers, nor for your mother. Ah, oh, no, don't say that, father, cried the son, bursting into tears and opening his mouth to confess all. But his father interrupted him, saying, you are aware of the condition of the family. You know that good will and sacrifices on the part of all are necessary. I myself, as you see, have had to double my work. I counted on a gift of a hundred lira from the railway company this month, and this morning I have learned that I shall receive nothing. At the news, Julio repressed the confession which was on the point of escaping from his soul, and repeated resolutely to himself, No, papa, I shall tell you nothing. I shall guard my secret for the sake of being able to work for you. I shall recompense you in another way for the sorrow I am causing you. I shall study enough at school to win promotion. The important point is to help you to earn our living, and to relieve you of the fatigue which is killing you. And so he went on, and two months more passed, of labor by night and weakness by day, of desperate efforts on the part of the son, and of bitter reproaches on the part of the father. But the worst of it was that the latter grew gradually colder towards the boy only spoke to him rarely, as though he had been a recreant son, of whom there was nothing any longer to be expected, and almost avoided meeting his glance. And Giulio perceived this and suffered from it, and when his father's back was turned, he threw him a furtive kiss, stretching forth his face with a sentiment of sad and dutiful tenderness, and between sorrow and fatigue he grew thin and pale, and he was forced to neglect his studies still further. He knew full well that there must be an end to it some day, and every evening he said to myself, I will not get up to-night, but when the clock struck twelve, at the moment when he should vigorously have reaffirmed this resolution, he felt remorse. It seemed to him that by remaining in bed he should be failing in a duty, and robbing his father and the family of a lira. He would rise, thinking that some night his father would wake up and discover him, or that he would find the deception by accident, by counting the wrappers twice and then all would come to a natural end without any act of his will, which he did not feel the courage to exert. And thus he went on. But one evening, at dinner, his father spoke a word which was decisive so far as he was concerned. His mother looked at him, and it seemed to her that he was more ill and weak than usual. She said to him, "'Julio, you are ill.' And then, turning to his father with anxiety, "'Julio is ill. See how pale he is.' "'Julio, my dear, how do you feel?' His father gave a hasty glance and said, "'It is his bad conscience that produces his bad health. He was not thus when he was a studious scholar and a loving son.' "'But he is ill!' exclaimed the mother. "'I don't care anything about him any longer,' replied the father. This remark was like a stab in the heart to the poor boy. Oh, he cared nothing any more. His father, who once had trembled at the mere sound of a cough from him, he no longer loved him. There was no more doubt about it. He was dead in his father's heart. "'Ah, oh, no, my father,' said the boy to himself, his heart oppressed with anguish. "'Now all is over indeed. I cannot live without your affection. I must have it all back. I will tell you all. I will deceive you no longer. I will study as of old, come what may, if you will only love me once more, my poor father. Oh, this time I am quite sure of my resolution.' Nevertheless, he rose that night again, by force of habit more than anything else, and when he was once up, he wanted to go and greet and see once more for the last time in the quiet of the night that little chamber where he had toiled so much in secret with his heart full of satisfaction and tenderness. And when he beheld again that little table with the lamp lighted and those white wrappers on which he was never more to write those names of towns and persons, which he had come to know by heart, he was seized with a great sadness, and with an impetuous movement he grasped the pen to recommence his accustomed toil. But in reaching out his hand he struck a book, and the book fell. The blood rushed to his heart. What if his father had waked? Certainly he would not have discovered him in the commission of a bad deed. He had himself decided to tell him all, and yet— The sound of that step approaching in the darkness, the discovery at that hour, in that silence. His mother— who would be awakened and alarmed, and the thought which had occurred to him for the first time, that his father might feel humiliated in his presence on thus discovering all. All this terrified him almost. He bent his ear with suspended breath. He heard no sound. He laid his ear to the lock of the door behind him, 
Nothing. The whole house was asleep. His father had not heard. He recovered his composure and set himself again to his writing, and wrapper was piled on wrapper. He heard the regular tread of the policemen below in the deserted street, then the rumble of a carriage which gradually died away. Then, after an interval, the rattle of a file of carts which passed slowly by, then a profound silence broken from time to time by the distant barking of a dog. And he wrote on and on, and meanwhile his father was behind him. He had risen on hearing the fall of the book, and had remained waiting for a long time. The rattle of the carts had drowned the noise of his footsteps and the creaking of the door-casing, and he was there with his white head bent over Julio's little black head, and he had seen the pen flying over the wrappers, and in an instant he had divined all, remembered all, understood all, and a despairing penitence, but at the same time an immense tenderness, had taken possession of his mind, and had held him nailed to the spot, and choking behind his child. Suddenly Julio uttered a piercing shriek. Two arms had pressed his head convulsively. "'Oh, Papa, Papa, forgive me, forgive me!' he cried, recognizing his parent by his weeping. "'Do you forgive me?' replied his father, sobbing, and covering his brow with kisses. "'I have understood all, I know all. It is I who asked your pardon, my blessed child. Come, come with me.' And he pushed, or rather carried him, to the bedside of his mother, who was awake, and throwing him into her arms, he said, "'Kiss this little angel of a son, who has not slept for three months, but has been toiling for me while I was saddening his heart, and he was earning our bread.' The mother pressed him to her breast and held him there, without the power to speak. At last she said, "'Go to sleep at once, my baby. Go to sleep and rest. Carry him to bed.' The father took him from her arms, carried him to his room, and laid him in his bed, still breathing hard and caressing him, and arranged his pillows and coverlets for him. "'Thanks, Papa,' the child kept repeating. "'Thanks. But go to bed yourself now. I am content. Go to bed, Papa.' but his father wanted to see him fall asleep. So he sat down beside the bed, took his hand, and said to him, "'Sleep, sleep, my little son.' And Giulio, being weak, fell asleep at last, and slumbered many hours, enjoying for the first time in months a tranquil sleep, enlivened by pleasant dreams. And as he opened his eyes, when the sun had already been shining for some time, he first felt, and then saw, close to his breast and resting upon the edge of the little bed, the white head of his father, who had passed the night thus, and who was still asleep, with his brow against his son's heart. Will. Wednesday, the 28th. None but Stardi in my school would have had the force to do what the little Florentine did. This morning two events occurred at the school. Garoffi became wild with delight, because his album had been returned to him with the addition of three postage stamps of the Republic of Guatemala, which he had been seeking for three months and Stardi took the second medal. Stardi, the next in the class after de Rossi, all were amazed at it. Who could ever have foretold it, when in October his father brought him to school bundled up in that big green coat, and said to the master, in the presence of every one, You must have a great deal of patience with him, because he is very hard of understanding. Every one credited him with a wooden head from the very beginning, but he said, I will burst or I will succeed, and he set to work doggedly while walking with set teeth and clenched fists, patient as an ox, obstinate as a mule, and thus, by dint of trampling on every one, disregarding mockery, and dealing kicks to disturbers, this big, thick head passed in advance of the rest. He did not understand the first thing of arithmetic. He filled his compositions with absurdities. He never succeeded in holding a phrase in his mind, and now he solves problems, writes correctly, and sings his lesson like a song and his iron will can be guessed when one sees how he is made, so very thick-set and squat, with a square head and no neck, with short, thick hands and a coarse voice. He studies even on scraps of newspaper and on theatre bills, and every time that he has ten soldi he buys a book. He has already collected a little library, and in a moment of good humour he allowed the promise to slip from his mouth that he would take me home and show it to me. He speaks to no one, he plays with no one, he is always on hand, on his bench, with his fists pressed to his temples, firm as a rock, listening to the teacher. How he must have toiled, poor Stardi! 
the master said to him this morning although he was impatient and in a bad humour when he bestowed the medals bravo stardy he who endures conquers but stardy did not appear in the least puffed with pride he did not smile and no sooner had he returned to his seat with the medal than he planted his fists on his temples again and became more motionless and more attentive than before but the finest thing happened when he went out of school for his father who is as big and squat as himself with a huge face and a huge voice was there waiting for him he had not expected this medal and he was not willing to believe it so that it was necessary for the master to reassure him and then he began to laugh heartily and tapped his son on the back of the neck saying energetically bravo good my dear pumpkin you'll do and he stared at him astonished and smiling and all the boys around him smiled too except stardy he was already running over the lesson for to-morrow morning in that huge head of his gratitude saturday the thirty first your schoolmate stardy never complains of his teacher i am sure of that the master was in a bad humour was impatient you say it in a tone of resentment think an instant how often you give way to acts of impatience and towards whom towards your father and your mother where your impatience is a crime your master has very good cause to be impatient at times reflect that he has been labouring for boys these many years and that if he has found many affectionate and noble individuals among them he has also found many ungrateful ones who have abused his kindness and ignored his toils and that among you all you cause him far more bitterness than satisfaction reflect that the most holy man on earth if placed in his position would allow himself to be conquered by wrath now and then and then if you only knew how often the teacher is feeling ill but teaches nevertheless because he is not ill enough to be excused from school and is impatient on account of his suffering and is pained to see that the rest of you do not notice it or abuse it respect love your master my son love him also because your father loves and respects him because he consecrates his life to the welfare of so many boys who will forget him love him because he opens and enlightens your intelligence and educates your mind because one of these days when you have become a man and when neither i nor he shall be in the world his image will often present itself to your mind side by side with mine and then you will see certain expressions of sorrow and weariness in his honest countenance to which you now pay no heed you will recall them and they will pain you even after the lapse of thirty years and you will feel ashamed you will feel sad at not having loved him at having behaved badly towards him love your master for he belongs to that vast family of fifty thousand elementary instructors scattered throughout all italy who are the intellectual fathers of the millions of boys who are growing up with you the labourers hardly recognised and poorly paid who are preparing in our country a people superior to those of the present i am not content with the affection which you have for me if you have it not also for all those who are doing you good and among those your master stands first after your parents love him as you would love a brother of mine love him when he caresses and when he reproves you when he is just and when he appears to you to be unjust love him when he is amiable and gracious and love him even more when you see him sad love him always and always pronounce with reverence that name of teacher which after that of father is the noblest the sweetest name which one man can apply to another man your father end of section seven section eight of heart a schoolboy's journal this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Clayton. Heart, a schoolboy's journal by Edmondo de Amicis, translated by Isabel Florence Hepgood. January, Part One. The Assistant Master, Wednesday the Fourth. My father was right. The master was in a bad humour because he was not well. For the past three days, in fact, the assistant had been coming in his stead, that little man without a beard who looks like a boy. A shameful thing happened this morning. There had been an uproar on the first and second days in the school because the assistant is very patient and does nothing but say, Be quiet, be quiet, I beg of you. 
but this morning they passed all bounds such a noise arose that his words were no longer audible and he admonished and besought but it was a mere waste of breath twice the principal appeared at the door and looked in but the moment he went away the murmur increased as in a market it was in vain that de rossi and garon turned round and made signs to the fellows to be good that it was a shame no one paid any heed to them stardi alone remained quiet with his elbows on the bench and his fists to his temples thinking perhaps about his famous library and garofi he of the hooked nose and postage stamps who was wholly occupied in making a catalogue of subscribers at two centesimi each for a lottery for a pocket inkstand the rest chattered and laughed pounded on the points of pens fixed in the benches and snapped pellets of paper at each other with the elastics of their garters the assistant grasped now one now another by the arm and shook him and he placed one of them against the wall time wasted he no longer knew what to do and he entreated them why do you behave like this do you wish to make me punish you and then he thumped the little table with his fist and shouted in a voice angry but tearful silence 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 it was hard to hear him but the noise kept getting louder franti threw a paper dart at him some gave cat calls others thumped each other on the head the hurly-burly was indescribable when all of a sudden the beadle entered and said senior master the principal has sent for you the teacher rose and went out in haste with a gesture of despair and then the tumult began more vigorously than ever but suddenly garon sprang up his face all flaming his fists clenched and shouted in a voice choked with rage stop this you are brutes you take advantage of him because he is kind if he were to bruise your bones for you you'd be as humble as dogs you're a pack of cowards the first one of you that jeers at him again i shall wait for outside and i shall break his teeth for him i swear it even under his father's very eyes all grew silent ah what a fine thing it was to see garon with his eyes darting flames he seemed to be a furious young lion he stared at the most daring one after the other and all hung their heads when the assistant came back with red eyes not a breath was to be heard he stood in amazement and then catching sight of garon who was still all fiery and trembling he understood it all and he said to him with accents of great affection as to a brother i thank you garon stardi's library i've been home with stardi who lives opposite the schoolhouse and i really felt some envy at the sight of his library he's not at all rich and he cannot buy many books but he preserves his school books with great care as well as those which his relatives give him and he lays aside every soldo he has given to him and spends it at the booksellers in this way he's collected quite a little library and when his father saw that he had this passion he bought him a handsome bookcase of walnut wood with a green curtain and he's had most of his volumes bound for him in the colours that he likes when he draws a little cord the green curtain runs back and three rows of books of every colour are seen all ranged in order and shining with gilt titles on their backs books of tales of travels and of poetry and some illustrated ones he understands how to combine colours well he places the white volumes next to the red ones and the yellow next to the black the blue beside the white so that viewed from a distance they make a very fine show and he amuses himself by varying the combinations he's made himself a catalogue he's like a librarian he's always standing near his books dusting them turning over the leaves looking at the bindings it's something to see the care with which he opens them with his big stubby hands and blows between the pages and then they seem perfectly new again i've worn out all of mine it's a delight for him to polish off every new book that he buys to put it in its place and to pick it up again to take another look at it from all sides and to brood over it as a treasure he showed me nothing else for a whole hour his eyes were troubling him because he'd read too much 
His father, who is large and thick-set like himself, with a big head like his, and who happened to come in the room, gave him two or three taps on the nape of his neck, saying with that huge voice of his, What do you think of him, eh, of this head of bronze? It's a stout head that will succeed in anything, I assure you. And Stardi half closed his eyes under those rough caresses like a big hunting dog. I do not know why, but I did not dare to jest with him. I could not realize that he was only a year older than myself. And when he said to me, farewell until we meet again at the door, with that funny face of his, I came very near to replying, I salute you, sir, as to a man. I told my father afterwards at home, I don't understand it. Stardi has no natural talent. He lacks fine manners, and his face is almost ridiculous, and yet he inspires me with respect. It is because he has character, replied my father. And I added, during the hour that I spent with him, he didn't utter fifty words, he didn't show me a single plaything, he didn't laugh once, and yet I liked to go there. And my father answered, that's because you value his society. The blacksmith's son. Yes, but I also value Prakosi's society. Indeed, it is a stronger feeling. Prakosi, the son of the blacksmith, that thin little fellow who has kind, sad eyes and a frightened air, who is so timid that he says to everyone, excuse me, who is always sickly and who nevertheless studies so much. His father goes home drunk and beats him without the slightest reason in the world and tosses his books and his copy books in every direction. And Prokosi comes to school with the black and blue marks on his face, and sometimes with his face all swollen and his eyes red with weeping. But never, never can he be made to acknowledge that his father beats him. Your father's been beating you, the boys say to him. That's not true, that's not true, he cries to avoid shaming his father. You did not burn this leaf, the teacher says to him, showing him his work, half burned. Yes, he replies in a trembling voice, I let it fall on the fire. But we know very well, nevertheless, that his drunken father overturned the table and the light with a kick while the boy was doing his work. He lives in a garret of our house, reached by another staircase. The janitress tells my mother everything. My sister Sylvia heard him screaming from the terrace one day when his father had thrown him headlong downstairs because he'd asked for a few soldi to buy a grammar. His father drinks but does not work, and his family suffers from hunger. Often Prokosi comes to school with an empty stomach and nibbles in secret at a roll which Garon had given him, or at an apple brought to him by the schoolmistress with the red feather who was his teacher at the first lower class. But he never says, I'm hungry, my father doesn't give me anything to eat. His father sometimes comes for him when he chances to be passing the schoolhouse, pale, unsteady on his legs, with a fierce face, his hair over his eyes and his cap awry, and the poor boy trembles all over when he catches sight of him in the street. But he immediately runs to meet him with a smile, and his father doesn't appear to see him, but seems to be thinking of something else. Poor Prokosi. He mends his torn copy books, borrows books to study his lessons, fastens the fragments of his shirt together with pins. It is pathetic to see him going through his gymnastics with those huge shoes in which he is fairly lost, in those trousers which drag on the ground, and that jacket which is too long and those huge sleeves turned back to the very elbows. And he studies. He does his best. He would be one of the best if he were able to work at home in peace. This morning he came to school with the marks of fingernails on one cheek, and they all began to say to him, It was your father, and you cannot deny it this time. It was your father who did that to you. Tell the principal about it, and he will have him arrested for it. But he sprang up, all flushed, with his voice trembling with indignation. It's not true. It's not true. My father never beats me. But afterwards, during lesson time, his tears fell upon the bench, and when anyone looked at him, he tried to smile in order that he might not show it. Poor Prakosi. Tomorrow, De Rossi, Coretti and Nelly are coming to my house. I want to tell him to come also. I want to have him take luncheon with me. 
I want to treat him to books and turn the house upside down to amuse him and to fill his pockets with fruit for the sake of seeing him happy for once. Poor Precosi, who is so good and so brave. A fine visit, Thursday the 12th. This has been one of the finest Thursdays of the year for me. At two o'clock precisely, De Rossi and Coretti came to the house with Nelly, the hunchback. Precosi's father did not let him come. De Rossi and Coretti were still laughing at their encounter with Crossi, the son of the vegetable seller in the street, the boy with the useless arm and the red hair, who was carrying a large cabbage for sale. With the soldo which he was to receive for the cabbage, he was to go and buy a pen. He was perfectly happy because his father had written from America that they might expect him any day. Oh, the two delightful hours that we passed together! De Rossi and Coretti are the two jolliest boys in the school. My father fell in love with them. Coretti had on his chocolate-coloured jacket and his catskin cap. He's a lively imp who always wants to be doing something, stirring up something, setting something to going. He'd already carried on his shoulders half a cartload of wood early that morning. Nevertheless, he pranced all over the house, taking note of everything and talking incessantly, as sprightly and nimble as a squirrel. Going into the kitchen, he asked the cook how much we had to pay a milligram for wood, because his father sells it at forty-five centesimi. He's always talking of his father, of the time when he was a soldier in the 49th Regiment, at the Battle of Custosa where he served in the squadron of Prince Umberto. He is so gentle in his manners. It makes no difference that he was born and brought up surrounded by wood. He has nobility in his blood, in his heart, so my father says. And De Rossi amused us greatly. He knows geography like a teacher. He shut his eyes and said, There I see the whole of Italy, the Apennines which extend to the Ionian Sea, the rivers flowing here and there, the white cities, the gulfs, the blue bays, the green islands. And he repeated the names correctly in their order and very rapidly as though he were reading them on the map. And at the sight of him standing thus with his head held high, with all his golden curls, with his closed eyes, and all dressed in bright blue with gilt buttons, as straight and handsome as a statue, we could not help admiring him. In one hour he had learnt by heart nearly three pages which he is to recite the day after tomorrow for the anniversary of the funeral of King Vittorio. Nelly also gazed at him in wonder and affection, smoothing the folds of his black cloth apron and smiling with his clear and mournful eyes. This visit gave me a great deal of pleasure. It left something like sparks in my mind and my heart. And it pleased me too when they went away to see poor Nelly between the other two tall, strong fellows who carried him home on their arms and made him laugh as I've never seen him laugh before. On going back into the dining room, I noticed that the picture of Rigoletto, the hunchback jester, was no longer there. My father had taken it away in order that Nelly might not see it. The Funeral of Victor Emmanuel, Tuesday the 17th. Today at two o'clock, as soon as we had entered the schoolroom, the master called up De Rossi, who went and took his place in front of the little table facing us, and began to recite in his vibrating tones, gradually raising his limpid voice and growing flushed in the face. Four years ago, on this day, at this hour, there arrived in front of the Pantheon at Rome the funeral car which bore the body of Victor Emmanuel, the first king of Italy, dead after a reign of twenty-nine years, during which the great Italian fatherland, broken up into seven states and oppressed by strangers and by tyrants, had been brought back to life in one single state, free and independent. After a reign of twenty-nine years, which he had made illustrious and beneficent with his valour, with loyalty, with boldness amid perils, with wisdom amid triumphs, with constancy amid fortune. The funeral car arrived, laden with wreaths, after having traversed Rome under a rain of flowers, amid the silence of an immense and sorrowing multitude, which had assembled from every part of Italy. 
preceded by a legion of generals and by a throng of ministers and princes, followed by a retinue of corporal veterans, by a forest of banners, by the envoys of three hundred towns, by everything which represents the power and glory of a people, it arrived before the august temple where the tomb awaited it. At that moment, twelve cuirassiers removed the coffin from the car. At that moment, Italy bade her last farewell to her dead king, to her old monarch whom she had loved so dearly, the last farewell to her soldier, to her father, to the twenty-nine most fortunate and most blessed years in her history. It was a grand and solemn moment. The eyes, the souls of all, were quivering at the sight of that coffin, and the darkened banners of the eighty regiments of the Army of Italy, borne by eighty officers, drawn up in line on its passage. For Italy was there in those eighty tokens, which recalled the thousands of dead, the torrents of blood, our most sacred glories, our most holy sacrifices, our most tremendous griefs. The coffin, borne by the cuirassiers, passed, and then the banners bent forward, and all together in salute. The banners of the new regiments, the old tattered banners of Giotto and Pastrengo, of Santa Lucia, of Novara, of Crimea, of Palstro, of San Martino, of Calis, of Castelfidardo. Eighty black veils fell, a hundred medals clashed against the staves, and that sonorous and confused uproar which stirred the blood of all was like the sound of a thousand human voices saying together, Farewell, good king, gallant king, loyal king. You will live in the hearts of your people as long as the sun shall shine over Italy. After this the banners rose heavenward once more, and King Victor entered into the immortal glory of the tomb. Franti expelled from school, Saturday 21st. Only one boy was capable of laughing while Derossi was declaiming the funeral oration of the king. It was Franti. I detest that fellow. He's wicked. When a father comes to the school to reprove his son, he enjoys it. When anyone cries, he laughs. He cowers before Garon and he strikes the little mason because he is small. He torments Grossi because he has a helpless arm. He ridicules Perecosi, whom everyone respects. He even jeers at Robetti, that boy in the second grade who walks on crutches through having saved a child. He provokes those who are weaker than himself, and when it comes to blows, he grows savage and tries to do harm. There is something beneath that low forehead in those turbid eyes kept nearly concealed under the visor of his small cap of waxed cloth, which inspires a shudder. He fears no one. He laughs in the master's face. He steals when he gets a chance and denies it brazenly. He's always in a quarrel with someone. He brings big pins to school to prick his neighbours with. He tears the buttons from his own jackets and from those of others and plays with them. His paper, books and copybooks are all crushed, torn, dirty. His ruler is jagged, his pens gnawed, his nails bitten, his clothes covered with stains and rents which he's got in his brawls. They say that his mother has fallen ill from the trouble that he causes her, and that his father has driven him from the house three times. His mother comes every now and then to make inquiries, and she always goes away in tears. He hates the school, he hates his companions, he hates the teacher. The master sometimes pretends not to see his rascalities, and he behaves all the worse. The master tried to get hold of him by kind treatment, and the boy ridiculed him for it. The master said terrible things to him, and the boy covered his face with his hands as though he were crying, but he was laughing. He was suspended from school for three days, and he came back more perverse and insolent than before. De Rossi said to him one day, Stop it! Don't you see how much the teacher suffers? And the other threatened to stick a nail into his stomach. 
but this morning at last he got himself driven out like a dog while the master was giving to Goron the rough draft of the Sardinian drummer boy, the monthly story for January, to copy, Franti threw a petard on the floor, which exploded, making the schoolroom resound as from a discharge of musketry. The whole class was startled by it. The master sprang to his feet and cried, Franti, leave the school! Franti retorted, it wasn't I, but he laughed. The master repeated, go! I won't stir, he answered. And then the master lost his temper and flung himself upon him, seized him by the arms, and tore him from his seat. He resisted, ground his teeth, and made him carry him out by main force. The master bore him thus heavy as he was to the principal, and then came back alone and seated himself at his little table, with his head clutched in his hands, out of breath, and with a look of such weariness and trouble that it was painful to see him after teaching school for thirty years he exclaimed sadly shaking his head no one breathed his hands were shaking with fury and the crosswise wrinkle in the middle of his forehead was so deep that it seemed like a wound poor master all felt sorry for him the rossi rose and said senior master do not grieve we love you and then he grew calmer and he said, We will go on with the lesson, boys. End of section eight. Recording by Gray Clayton. Section nine of Heart, a schoolboy's journal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. Heart, a schoolboy's journal by Edmundo de Amicis, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. January, part two. The Sardinian Drummer Boy, monthly story. On the first day of the Battle of Costosa, the twenty fourth of July, eighteen forty eight, about sixty soldiers belonging to an infantry regiment of our army who had been sent to a hill to occupy a lonely house suddenly found themselves attacked by two companies of austrian soldiers who showering them with bullets from various quarters hardly gave them time to take refuge in the house and to barricade the doors after leaving several dead and wounded in the field Having barred the doors, our men ran in haste to the windows of the ground floor and the first story, and began to fire brisk discharges at their assailants, who, approaching gradually, ranged in a semicircle, made vigorous reply. The sixty Italian soldiers were commanded by two non-commissioned officers and a captain, a tall, thin, austere old man with white hair and a moustache and with them was a Sardinian drummer boy, a lad of little over fourteen, who did not look twelve, small with an olive-brown complexion and small, deep-set, sparkling eyes. The captain directed the defence from a room on the first floor, hurling commands like pistol shots, and no sign of emotion was visible on his iron countenance. The drummer boy, a little pale but firm on his legs, had jumped upon a table and was holding fast to the wall and stretching out his neck in order to gaze out of the windows. Through the smoke on the fields he saw the white uniforms of the Austrians who were slowly advancing. The house was situated at the summit of a steep declivity and on the side of a slope it had one high window corresponding to a chamber on the roof. Therefore the Austrians did not threaten the house from that quarter and the slope was free. The fire beat only on the front and the two ends. But it was a fearful fire. The hailstorm of leaden bullets which split the walls on the outside, ground the tiles to powder, and in the interior cracked ceilings, furniture, window frames, and door frames, sending splinters of wood flying through the air, and clouds of plaster, and fragments of kitchen utensils and glass, whizzing and rebounding and breaking everything with noise enough to smash one's skull 
from time to time one of the soldiers who were firing from the windows fell crashing back to the floor and was dragged to one side some staggered from room to room pressing their hands on their wounds there was already one dead body in the kitchen with his forehead cleft the semicircle of the enemy was drawing together at a certain point the captain hitherto impassive was seen to make a gesture of uneasiness and to leave the room with huge strides followed by a sergeant three minutes later the sergeant returned on a run and summoned the drummer boy making him a sign to follow the lad followed him at a quick pace up the wooden staircase and entered with him into a bare garret where he saw the captain writing with a pencil on a sheet of paper as he leaned against the little window and on the floor at his feet lay the well rope the captain folded the sheet of paper and said sharply as he fixed his cold grey eyes before which all the soldiers trembled on the boy drummer the drummer boy put his hand to his cap you have courage asked the captain the boy's eyes flashed yes captain he replied look down there said the captain pushing him to the window on the plain near the houses of villafranca where there is a gleam of bayonets there stand our troops motionless you are to take this message tie yourself to the rope descend from the window get down that slope in an instant make your way across the fields reach our men and give the note to the first officer you see throw off your belt and knapsack the drummer boy took off his belt and his knapsack and thrust the note into his breast pocket the sergeant flung the rope out of the window and held one end of it clutched fast in his hands the captain helped the lad to clamber out of the small window with his back turned to the field now look out he said the salvation of this detachment lies in your courage and in your legs trust to me senor captain replied the drummer boy as he let himself down bend over on the slope said the captain grasping the rope with the sergeant never fear god aid you in a few moments the drummer boy was on the ground the sergeant drew in the rope and disappeared the captain stepped boldly in front of the window and saw the boy flying down the slope he was already hoping that the boy had succeeded in escaping unobserved when five or six little puffs of dust which rose from the earth in front of and behind the lad warned him that he had been espied by the austrians who were firing down on him from the top of the hill these little clouds were thrown into the air by the bullets but the drummer boy continued to run at a headlong speed all at once he fell killed roared the captain clenching his fists but before he had uttered the word he saw the drummer spring up again ah only a fall the captain said to himself and drew a long breath the drummer in fact set out again at full speed but he limped he's turned his ankle thought the captain again several cloudlets of dust rose here and there about the lad but ever more distant he was safe the captain gave a shout of triumph but he continued to follow him with his eyes trembling because it was an affair of minutes if he didn't arrive yonder in the shortest possible time with the note which called for instant succour either all his soldiers would be killed or he should be obliged to surrender himself a prisoner with them the boy ran rapidly for a space and then relaxed his pace and limped and then resumed his course but grew constantly more wearied and every little while he stumbled and paused perhaps a bullet has grazed him thought the captain and he noted all his movements quivering with excitement and he encouraged him he spoke to him as though the boy could hear him he measured constantly with a flashing eye the space intervening between the fleeing figure and the gleam of arms which he could see in the distance amid the fields of grain gilded by the sun and meanwhile he heard beneath the imperious and angry shouts of the sergeants and the officers the piercing groans of the wounded the ruin of furniture and the fall of rubbish on courage he shouted following the far-off drummer with a glance forward run he halts that cursed boy ah he resumes his course 
an officer came panting to tell him that the enemy without slackening their fire were flinging out a white flag to hint at a surrender don't reply to them he cried without taking his eyes from the boy who was already on the plain but who was no longer running and who seemed to be dragging himself along with difficulty go run said the captain clenching his teeth and his fists let them kill you die you rascal but go and then he uttered a horrible oath ah the infamous poltroon he has sat down in fact the boy whose head he had hitherto been able to see above a field of grain had disappeared as though he had fallen but after the lapse of a minute it came into sight again finally it was lost behind the hedges and the captain saw it no more and then the captain came down resolutely the bullets were coming in at a tempest the rooms were encumbered with the wounded some of whom were whirling around like drunken men and clutching at the furniture the walls and the floor were bespattered with blood corpses lay across the doorways the lieutenant had his arm shattered by a ball smoke and clouds of dust enveloped everything courage shouted the captain stand firm at your post relief is on the way courage for a little while longer the austrians had approached still nearer their contorted faces were already visible through the smoke and amid the crash of the firing their furious shouts were heard uttering insults suggesting a surrender and threatening slaughter some of the soldiers were terrified and withdrew from the windows the sergeants drove them forward again but the fire of the defence weakened discouragement was seen on all faces it was not possible to resist much longer and then the fire of the austrians slackened and a thundering voice shouted first in german and then in italian surrender no shouted the captain from the window and the firing recommenced more fast and furious on both sides more soldiers fell already more than one window was without defenders the fatal moment was near at hand the captain muttered through his teeth in a strangled voice they're not coming they're not coming and he rushed wildly about twisting his sword in his convulsively clenched hand and resolved to die when a sergeant descending from the garret uttered a piercing shout they are coming they are coming repeated the captain with a cry of joy and that cry all well and wounded sergeants and officers rushed to the windows and the resistance became fierce once more a few moments later a sort of uncertainty was noticeable a beginning of disorder among the foe the captain hastily collected a little troop in the room on the ground floor in order to make a sortie with fixed bayonet and then he flew upstairs scarcely had he arrived there when they heard a hasty trampling of feet accompanied by a formidable hurrah and saw from the windows the two pointed hats of the italian carabineers advancing through the smoke a squadron rushing forward at great speed and a lightning flash of blades whirling in the air as they fell on the heads shoulders and on backs and then the troop darted out of the door with bayonets presented the enemy wavered were thrown into disorder and turned in flight the field was cleared the house was free and a little later two battalions of italian infantry and two cannon occupied the height the captains with the soldiers that remained to him rejoined his regiment went on fighting and was slightly wounded in the left hand by a spent ball in the final assault with bayonets the day ended with the victory on our side but on the following day the conflict having begun again the italians were defeated by the overwhelming numbers of the austrians in spite of a valorous resistance and on the morning of the twenty seventh they sadly retreated towards Mincio. the captain although wounded made the march on foot with his soldiers weary and silent and arrived at the close of the day at guito on the Mincio. he at once sought out his lieutenants who had been picked up by the ambulance with his arm shattered and who must have arrived before him he was directed to a church where the field hospital had been installed in haste he went there the church 
was full of wounded men ranged in two lines of beds and on mattresses spread on the floor two doctors and numerous assistants were going and coming busily occupied and suppressed cries and groans could be heard no sooner had the captain entered than he halted and cast a glance around in search of his officer at that moment he heard himself called in a weak voice senor captain he turned around it was his drummer boy he was lying on a cot bed covered to the breast with a coarse window curtain in red and white squares with his arms on the outside pale and thin but his eyes still sparkled like black gems are you here asked the captain amazed but still sharply bravo you did your duty i did all i could replied the drummer boy were you wounded said the captain seeking with his eyes for his officer in the neighbouring beds what could one expect said the lad who gained courage by speaking expressing the lofty satisfaction of having been wounded for the first time without which he would not have dared to open his mouth in the presence of his captain i had a fine run all bent over but suddenly they caught sight of me i should have arrived twenty minutes earlier if they had not hit me luckily i soon came across a captain of the staff to whom i gave the note but it was hard work to get down after that little pat i was dying of thirst i was afraid that i should not get there at all i wept with rage at the thought that at every moment of delay another man was setting out yonder for the other world but enough i did what i could i am content but with your permission captain you should look to yourself you are losing blood several drops of blood had in fact trickled down on the captain's fingers from his imperfectly bandaged palm would you like to have me give the bandage a turn captain hold it here a minute the captain held out his left hand and stretched out his right to help the lad to loosen the knot and to tie it again but no sooner had the boy raised himself from his pillow that he turned pale and was obliged to fall back once more that will do that will do said the captain looking at him and withdrawing his bandaged hand which the other tried to retain attend to your own affairs instead of thinking of others the things that are not severe may become serious if they are neglected the drummer boy shook his head but you said the captain observing him attentively must have lost a great deal of blood to be as weak as this lost blood replied the boy with a smile something else beside blood look he drew aside the coverlet the captain started back in horror the lad had but one leg his left leg had been cut off above the knee the stump was wrapped in blood-stained cloths at that moment a small fat military surgeon passed in his shirt sleeves ah captain he said rapidly nodding towards the drummer this is a sad case there is a leg that might have been saved if he had not exerted himself in such a crazy manner that cursed inflammation it had to be cut off away up here oh but he's a brave lad i can assure you he never shed a tear nor uttered a cry he was proud of being an italian boy while i was performing the operation upon my word of honour he comes of a good race by heavens and he went away on a run the captain wrinkled his heavy white brows gazed fixedly at the drummer boy and spread the coverlet over him again and slowly almost unconsciously and still gazing intently at him he raised his hands to his head and lifted his cap senor captain exclaimed the boy in amazement what are you doing senor captain to me and then that rough soldier who had never before said a gentle word to an inferior replied in an indescribably sweet and tender voice i am only a captain you are a hero he bent over with widespread arms upon the drummer boy and pressed him three times to his heart the love of country tuesday twenty fourth since the tale of the drummer boy has touched your heart it should be easy for you this morning to write your composition for examination why you love italy well why do i love italy do not a hundred answers present themselves to you on the instant i love italy because my mother is an italian because the blood that flows in my veins is italian 
because the soil in which i bury the dead whom my mother mourns and whom my father venerates is italian because the town in which i was born the language that i speak the books that educate me because my brother my sister my comrades the great people among whom i live and the beautiful nature which surrounds me and all that i see that i love that i study that i admire is italian oh you cannot feel that affection to the full you will feel it when you become a man when returning from a long journey after a prolonged absence you step up in the morning to the bulwarks of the vessel and see on the distant horizon the lofty blue mountains of your country you will feel it then in the impetuous flood of tenderness which will fill your eyes with tears and will wrest a cry from your heart you will feel it in some great and distant city in that impulse of the soul which will draw you from the strange throng towards a working man from whom you have heard in passing a word in your own tongue you will feel it in that sad haughty anger which will drive the blood in your brow when you hear insults to your country from the mouth of a stranger you will feel it in more proud and vigorous measure on the day when the menace of a hostile race shall call forth a tempest of fire upon your country and when you shall behold arms raging on every side youths thronged in legions fathers kissing their children and saying courage mothers bidding adieu to their young sons and crying conquer you will feel it like a joy divine if you have the good fortune to behold the re-entrance to your town of the regiments weary ragged with thin ranks yet terrible with the splendour of victor in their eyes and their banners torn by bullets followed by a vast convoy of brave fellows bearing their bandaged heads and their stumps of arms loftily amid a wild throng which covers them with flowers with blessings and with kisses then you will comprehend the love of country then you will feel your country enrico it is a grand and sacred thing may i one day see you return in safety from a battle fought for her safe you who are my flesh and soul but if i should learn that you had preserved your life because you were concealed from death your father who now welcomes you with a cry of joy when you return from school would then receive you with a sob of anguish i should never be able to love you again i should die with that dagger in my heart your father envy wednesday twenty fifth the boy who wrote the best composition on the love of country was de rossi as usual and votini thought himself sure of the first medal i like votini well enough though he is rather vain and does dress up a trifle too much but it makes me scorn him now that i am his neighbour on the bench to see how envious he is of de rossi he would like to rival him he studies hard but he cannot do it by any possibility for de rossi is ten times as strong as he is on every point and votini rails at him carlo nobis envies him too but he has so much pride in his body that purely from pride he keeps it hidden votini on the other hand betrays himself he complains at home of his difficulties and says that the master is unjust to him when de rossi replies so promptly and so well to questions as he always does votini's face clouds over he hangs his head pretends not to hear or tries to laugh but he laughs awkwardly and every one knows about it so that when the master praises de rossi they all turn to look at votini who chews his venom and muratorino makes a hare's face at him to-day for instance he was put on the rack the principal entered the room and announced the result of the examination de rossi ten tenths and the first medal votini gave a huge sneeze the master looked at him it was not hard to understand the matter votini he said do not let the serpent of envy into your body it is a serpent that gnaws at the brain and corrupts the heart every one stared at him except de rossi Bodini tried to make some answer, but could not. He sat there as though turned to stone, and with a white face. 
and then while the master was conducting the lesson he began to write in large characters on a sheet of paper i am not jealous of those who gain the first medal through favouritism and injustice it was a note which he meant to send to derossi but in the meantime i saw that derossi's neighbours were plotting amongst themselves and whispering in each other's ears and one cut with a penknife from paper a big medal on which they had drawn a black serpent votini also noticed this the master went out for a few moments all at once de rossi's friends rose and left their seats for the purpose of coming and solemnly presenting the paper medal to votini the whole class was prepared for a scene votini had already begun to quiver all over de rossi exclaimed give that to me so much the better they replied you are the one who ought to carry it de rossi took the medal and tore it into bits at that moment the master returned and resumed the lesson I kept my eye on Votini. He had turned as red as a coal. He took his sheet of paper very, very quietly, as though in absence of mind, rolled it into a ball on the sly, put it in his mouth, chewed it a little, and then spit it out under the bench. And then school broke up. Votini, who was a little confused, dropped his blotting paper as he passed to Rossi. De Rossi politely picked it up, put it in Votini's satchel, and helped him to buckle the straps. Votini dared not raise his eyes. Franti's mother, Saturday the 28th. But Votini is stubborn. Yesterday morning, during the lesson on religion, in the presence of the principal, the teacher asked De Rossi if he knew by heart the two couplets in the reading book. Wherever I turn my gaze, tis the great God I see. De Rossi said that he did not, and Bottini suddenly exclaimed, I know them, with a smile as though to pique De Rossi. But he was piqued himself instead, for he could not recite the poetry, because Franti's mother suddenly flew into the schoolroom, breathless, with her grey hair dishevelled and all wet with snow, and pushing before her her son, who had been suspended from school for a week. What a sad scene we were doomed to witness! The poor woman flung herself almost on her knees before the principal, with clasped hands, and besought him. Oh, Signor Director, do me the favour to put my boy back in school. He has been at home for three days. I have kept him hidden, but God have mercy on him. If his father finds out about this affair, he will murder him. Have pity. I no longer know what to do. I entreat you with my whole soul. The principal tried to lead her out, but she resisted and continued to pray and weep. Oh, if you only knew the trouble that this boy has caused me, you would have pity. Do me this favour. I hope that he will reform. I shall not live long, senior director. I bear death within me, but I should like to see him reformed before my death, because— And she broke into a passion of weeping. He is my son. I love him. I shall die in despair. Take him back once more, senior director, that a misfortune may not happen in the family. Do it out of pity for a poor woman. And she covered her face with her hands and sobbed. Franti stood impassive and hung his head. The headmaster looked at him, reflected a little, and then said, Franti, go to your place. And then the woman removed her hands from her face, quite comforted, and began to express thanks upon thanks without giving the director a chance to speak, and made her way towards the door, wiping her hands, and saying hastily, I beg of you, my son, may all have patience. Thanks, senior director, you have performed a deed of mercy. Be a good boy. Good day, boys. Thanks, senior teacher. Goodbye, and forgive a poor mother. And after bestowing another supplicating glance on her son from the door, she went away, pulling up the shawl which was trailing after her, pale, bent, with a head which still shook, and we heard her coughing all the way down the stairs. The principal gazed intently at Franti amid the silence of the class, and said to him in stern accents, Franti, you are killing your mother. We all turned to look at Franti, and that infamous boy smiled. Hope, Sunday, 29th. 
very beautiful enrico was the impulse which made you fling yourself on your mother's heart on your return from your lesson on religion yes your master said grand and consoling things to you god threw us in each other's hands he will never part us when i die when your father dies we shall not speak to each other those despairing words mamma papa enrico i shall never see you again we shall see each other again in another life where he who has suffered much in this life will receive reward where he who has loved much on earth will find again the souls whom he has loved in a world without sin without sorrow and without death but we must all render ourselves worthy of that other life reflect my son every good action of yours every impulse of affection for those who love you every courteous act towards your companions every noble thought of yours is like a leap towards that other world and every misfortune also serves to raise you towards that world every sorrow since it has the expiation of a sin just as every tear blots out a stain make it your rule to become better and more loving every day than the day before say every morning to-day i shall do something for which my conscience will praise me and with which my father will be satisfied something which will render me beloved by such or such a comrade by my teacher by my brother or by others and pray god to give you the strength to put your resolution into practice lord i wish to be good noble courageous gentle sincere help me grant me that every night when my mother gives me her last kiss i may be able to say to her you kissed this night a nobler and more worthy boy than you kissed last night keep always in your thoughts that other supernatural and blessed enrico which you may be after this life and pray you cannot imagine the sweetness that you experience how much better a mother feels when she sees her child with hands clasped in prayer when i behold you praying it seems impossible to me that there should not be someone there gazing at you and listening to you and then i believe more firmly that there is a supreme goodness and an infinite piety i love you more i work with more ardour i endure with more force i forgive with all my heart and i think of death with serenity o oh, dear and good god to hear once more after death the voice of my mother to meet my children again to see my enrico once more my enrico blessed and immortal and to clasp him in an embrace which shall never more be loosed never more never more to all eternity oh pray let us pray let us love each other let us be good let us bear this celestial hope in our hearts and souls my adored child your mother end of section nine recording by gray clayton